Joshua chapter 6. I don't know how many of you are UFC fans, you know, fight. There's a host called Bruce Buffer. Every time there's a fight, he has to, to say this slogan. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event of the evening. And now, it's time, right? And everybody gets excited because it's time to fight. It's time to see that two men fighting and bleeding and all these things happening. But we come to this text. It's, I almost hear his voice. It's time to conquer the land. It's time to fight. It's time to have this battle. This is one of the most famous battles of the Bible. And yet, there's no fight. <laughs> it's so funny, right? Because the Lord is guiding. The Lord finally allowed them to conquer Jericho. We saw chapter 5. We saw that the Lord ordered them to circumcise, to have the Passover. And we, we, we see that in the end of chapter 5, this, uh, this encounter of Joshua and this great commander that we see through the Scripture, that is the, the, the personified presence of Jesus. So the Lord allowed them to go now and conquer. So there was a, no battle to be fought. But again, what, what does this text brings us, brings our, our attention to? That this fight, this battle is not Israel versus Canaan. It is God versus Canaan. It's not about the, the efforts and the, the power of the, the Israelite army. No. Will these people then trust the Lord? Will they trust God in the directions that God gives them? It all comes to the matter or to the area of faith. Faith in God. Faith in what God is telling them to do. And before we start reading Joshua chapter 6, you don't have to open your Bible, but we see that event mentioned in the New Testament in Hebrews eleven thirty. It says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down, after they have been encircled for seven days. It was not by the power of the army of, Jer of the Israelites. It was not about the great shout they gave or the trumpets. No. It was by faith. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they have been encircled for seven days. They heard God's word. They believed and they obeyed. Then they say, they, they see that fulfillment. They see what God said was going to happen. They see it happening. So what we will see in this text, we will, we will see that God will fight for you. So you must respond in faith and obedience. God will fight for you. So you must respond in faith and obedience. If, if you want to, I... I I have this habit of when I listen to sermons, I write things down a lot. If you want to bring notes, uh, bring your notebooks to, to the service, or you have a, a, a notebook, please do that. It helps us when we go through the week to remind ourselves of the word that we heard. So God will fight for you, so we must respond in faith and obedience. So the first part of the text we see from verses 1 through 5. They must hear when they God says. God says, I have given Jericho to you. Let's read verses 1 through 5. Now, Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its kings and mighty men of valor. Verse 3. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus, you shall do for six days. 
Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat. And the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. Let's pray. Father, what we don't know, please, teachers, what we don't have, please give us. And what we are not, please make us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, how is this text this part that we read, um, help us with that. God says, I have given Jericho to you. In verse 1, we see that Jericho was shut up because of the people of Israel. You know what happened before? You know, the, the open river, the, the Jordan River, you know the great things that the Lord did? People were scared. They, they shut this this. This city, no one goes in, no one goes out. They are waiting what's going to happen to us. And we see in the story of Rahab that they even heard what God did before that, opened the Red, opening the Red Sea. And Rahab believed in that God. She renounced all the gods of Canaan and believed in the God of Israel. And she helped the spies there. So everything that happened, had happened up until that moment. That's why they, they were like this. And verse 2, it says, The Lord said to Joshua, Some commentators would say that the Lord is the same one that was talking to Joshua in chapter 5, verses 13. It's, it's like the continuation of that conversation because we end chapter uh, 5 with... Take off your sandals because this place is holy. And Joshua did so. And then that's it. That's the end of chapter 5. So some scholars would believe that this is just the, the natural flow of this conversation. Some say that this is a different event. No matter what strand you go, one thing is true. God spoke to Joshua. And that's what is important. God gave instruction, instructions to him. And, and the first thing that God says to him is, is, see, you see, Joshua. God draws Joshua's attention to the supreme revelation on which everything else hangs. Joshua, do you see what I'm doing? Do you see here? I have given Jericho to you. The promises of God, and notice here how God says it. I have given Jericho to you. It's a, it's a reality. It's a, it's a present reality. You already have it. But wait, wait. The city is closed. The army hasn't defeated them yet. So why, why are you saying you've given? Because for God, there's no problem with that. There's no problem for God. For God, that is a re reality already. God is so powerful, so true that when he sees and when he says things, it's already reality. He speaks the reality of what's going to happen. Isn't that what we see in the New Testament? In Romans 8, for example, he says, Those he predestined, he chose, and he saved, justified, in past tense, and he sanctified, and he glorified. But we're not in our glorified bodies yet. But for God, that's already happened. It's already a reality. So there's nothing impossible for our God. The promises of God creates possibilities not in, inherent to the present situation. The promises of God is a reality even if it hasn't happened yet. Because God is the one who's saying. It's not in the, the, the amount of faith that the people of God has is not a, the, the amount of faith that you have to receive the promises of God. Your salvation, your relationship with God is not based upon your good deeds. 
It's not based upon your good Christian life. It's based upon the promises of God. So these present, present circumstances versus God's promises, it's always def defeated by God's pro promises. God's promises will always be winning. Remember when Abraham was childless in Genesis 15? He said, God, you promised the son, but I'm childless. Again, Paul says, we're living the, in suffering now, but there's nothing compared to the glory to come. Because my eyes is fixed in the glory to come. Verse 3, God says, you shall march around the walls of Jericho, right? You shall march around the city. Let's be honest here. This is not a normal strategy. This is not the strategy that we would use. I'm not even in the army. I don't even know how to do things, <laughs> war strategy. But, I mean, if I was going to do that, I would not choose this. But our wisdom is so limited before the wisdom of God. And what God wants here is not a clear understanding for, for us. Sometimes when I'm um, asking my children to obey, why do I have to do this? Or if my five-year-old is playing on the street and I say, come inside right now, I don't have to debate with him why, why it's a good thing for him to obey him, me because or it's rainy or because there's a car coming, things that he doesn't see. I don't have to explain everything to him. I want him to obey because he knows me and he trusts me. We are to do with God the same. Even if we don't understand, if it does not make sense for us, we are to obey him. Even if it hurts, even if it, it's not pleasant to us, but if it's God's will, we are to do it. We are to obey God's voice. Do you remember what happened with Gideon? When he had this 20,000 army, and God said, no, it's too many. I just need 300. Just 300 people. Or the healing of uh, Naaman. Go into this river and go into the river seven times. Don't they have better rivers there? Yeah. They don't have gators as we do, but they have better rivers there. But this is one commentator called the strange strategy of God. The strange strategy of God is that is God is calling us not for a reason with our little fickle minds. God is calling us obedience. Verse 4, we see seven priests shall bear seven trumpets. Seven is a is a memorial number in the, the scriptures. It, it refers also to creation, to the completion of creation, to the perfection of creation. And it's on the seventh day they shall act. God, is, God has a point here. And they are to do that with a great shout. A shout there in the original means the shout of battle, but it also means the, shadow, the shout of victory, the shout of joy. For a, for a human point of view, it seems unlikely that these Israelites could conquer Jericho with that strategy. Where else do we see strange strategies of God? And particularly into our reality now. We see a strange strategy that God decided to do to redeem his people. It's the cross. God became a man who went to the cross, bearing our sins and our guilt. He rose from the dead, offering forgiveness and new beginnings. The guilty goes free, and the innocent Jesus gets punished. This is a strange strategy. Living in the light of the kingdom of God. We are always living counterculturally. 
the first shall be last. The master washes the feet of the disciples. Our enemies, you know what we do with our enemies? We bless them. We pray for them. We walk an extra mile. We give them food. We give them water. Because we don't live in the reality of this world. We're under this strange reality. In this kingdom reality. Our lives now are not that important as the world thinks. You need pleasure. You need to live for yourself. You need quality of life. You need to, to have things, have toys, have stuff for yourselves. Our lives are not for ourselves. Paul says, for me, to live is Christ. I live for him. Even if it does not make sense to the world, I live for his glory. I live for his kingdom. We truly follow these strange strategies in the eyes of the world, but our confidence is actually in him who told us to walk around Jericho in silence, to live in this world for his glory. Even for young people today, young people are... They have no option. They're given condoms when they're 10, 11 in school. They're extremely exposed to that sexual culture. And living in custody, living, waiting to have sexual relationship when they are married, this is crazy. This is not good. Are you really not going to try before you, you get married? For a young person today, the, the peer pressure. But to live for me is Christ. We do, not, we do not hold our children or the young people of the church by pressuring them with the law. But when we expose the light of the gospel, it's Jesus is so compelling that Everything else is not important. And everything else I live behind because it doesn't matter now for me. All I want is to live for Christ. So I don't do things, not because people are telling me, but because I love this word. And I love the God who inspired it. This is the word of God. So we defend the innocent child, we work honestly, we do all this counterculturally because of Christ. What else in the text did God demand for his people? This is what we see. God says, take up the ark. Let's read verses 6 through 16. So Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, take up the ark of the covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, go forward, march around the city, and let the armed men pass, pass on before the ark of the Lord. And just as Joshua had commanded the people, the seven priests bearing the, ark, the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets with the ark of the covenant of the Lord following them. Verse 9. The armed men were walking before the priests who were blowing the trumpets, and the rear guard was walking after the ark while the trumpets blew continually. But Joshua commanded the people, You shall not shout or make your voice heard, neither shall any word go out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout. Then you shall shout. Verse 11. So he caused the ark of the Lord to circle the city, going about it once. And they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. And the seven priests, bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord, walked on, and they blew the trumpets continually. And, they ar and the armed men were walking before them, and the rear guard was 
walking after the ark of the Lord, while the trumpets blew continually. Verse 14, 14. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned into the camp. So they did for six days. On the seventh day, they rose early at the dawn of day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. God says, Take up the ark. You take up the ark. God will not take up the ark for you. Even though God promised the land, even though God said, I have given you the land, you take up the ark. You walk in obedience. Joshua is commanding the people of the Lord as the Lord told him. The ark here is mentioned 10 times in this text. You see that the ark is this main character. It's the presence of the living God. It's representing his presence. Notice that the ark always goes before the people. God is, is fighting this battle, not Israel. God is leading them. In verse 8 and verse 9, they, were, they just started doing it. Can you imagine the, the scene? The people of Canaan looking in, in, into, through the walls. And seeing these people going around, blowing horns, how crazy that is. Even though they were scared, I'm just hypothesizing here. So maybe some of them started mocking him, them. You crazy? What are you doing? That does not make sense. That's not, we'll grant you, you'll not win battles with that. But Joshua told them in verse 10, you will make no sound. You will be silenced. You need to be quiet. I don't want to hear anything from you when you walk around the city. And one commentator said this, silence is the hardest of all the commandments. Right? You remember the people in the Exodus? Everything they did was complain and nag and, and say, I miss the onions of Egypt. Who misses onions, right? I don't know. But... These people did. Silence. It is only the still heart that can reflect the heaven of God's overreaching care. It's the still heart. The first step, you obey God, but you do it in silence. And God wants your obedience too. First Samuel 15, we see that obedience is better than sacrifice. They're doing this strange strategy. They're walking in silence. And I would, like, I would, I would love to, to bring here uh, an illustration that I learned with Dr. D.A. Carson when he was talking about another text, the text of the Lamb. Uh, but I want to bring to this context here. Let's imagine that we have two cities that God told them to do this, like Jericho. Two Israelite city, let's call it Los Angeles and New York, very Israel, right? So, and two soldiers meet on the sixth day. And the soldier from New York said, talking to the, the other guy in Los Angeles, he says, man, I don't know. That's so strange. We're, we're people of the war, and they're, t they're telling us, Joshua told us to go around the city. How crazy that is. That's not, I don't know. And the other guy from New York, man, I know because God said it was true. It's going to happen. Everything that God said is going to happen. Have you, have you been doing that all the time in silence? And the guy from Los Angeles, yeah, we have. We're obeying. But I don't know. Tomorrow's the day. Tomorrow, I, I don't know. And this guy from New York is like, oh, man, I know. I know that God will do that because he did everything in the past. He opened the, the Jordan River and he opened the Red Sea. So I know it's going to happen. So the seventh day comes. Which city will see the fall? New York or Los Angeles? 
and they all obey. They do what the Lord commanded. The answer is both. Both cities will see the walls fall. Why? Because they do not win battles on the ground of the intensity or the clarity of the faith exercised. But on the ground of God's word, it's God who said it was going to happen. And it, as they follow God, even though if the intensity of their obedience is not that high, God will fulfill that. Because our faith is not the goal. The goal is the object of our faith that is Christ. He is the one. It's not based upon the deeds that we do. It's based upon in God who is the main character in that story. Who is the one promising. So it's the word of God that guarantees our place before him. How many times have we doubted if God can never love us? After we have done so stupid, thinful, sinful things. If them be, after being a Christian for 40 years, for 30 years, does God really love me? What are you going to answer before God? That you tried hard? That you did your best? Is that your ground before God? Is that how you stand before God? I have no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. That is the ground of our faith. It is not our intensity. It's not the intensity of our faith, but the object of our faith that saves us. Verses 15 and 16 says, Shout, shout for the Lord has given you the city. What are we ought to do with that? We are to learn about God's timing. There are some times that we need to be quiet, and there are some times that we need to shout. There are some times that we just need to say, God, it's on you. And there are times that we need to follow his instructions. And the third part of our text, it's a bit controversial. It's a bit strange. But God says, the prostitute shall live. Verses 17 through 27. And the city wall and all that is within... It shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and all who are with her in her house shall live. Because she hid the messengers whom we sent. Verse 18. But she, no, but you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction. Lest when you have devoted them you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. 20. So the people shouted and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout and the wall fell down down flat so the people went up into ev into the city every man straight before him and they captured the city then they devoted all in the city to destruction both men and women young and old oxen sheep and donkeys with the edge of the sword 22 but to the men who said who had spied out the land joshua said go into the prostitute's house and bring out from there, the woman and all who belonged to her, as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. And they brought all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. 24. And they burned the city with fire and everything in it. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab, the prostitute, and her father's household, and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. 
Joshua laid an oath on them at that time, saying, Cursed be before the Lord the man who rises up and rebuilds this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation, and at the cost of his youngest son shall he set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. They, in, in verse 17, they devoted the, to the Lord the things for destructions. And this verb here means they separated. They devoted. They, they separated for the Lord. We you see here that the prostitute shall live. It means that this prom, his promise stands. God has a plan for the world. God is showing here in, in the beginning of this, this conquer of the land that he intends to bring salvation to all the nations of the world. This word prostitute is very impactful word and is intentionally used here several times, right? Bring out the prostitute, Rahab the prostitute. Every uh, person needs to be comprehending that we need to comprehend that this should not be um, strange to us. We're all sinners. We're only saved because God is so graceful. We're only saved because God's merciful. In verse 19, God says, Every silver and gold belongs to God, of course, because He's the one fighting this battle. He needs to receive all the, the, the outcomes of that in the gold, right? And it's also pointing that the people will collect them for God. Verses 22 and 23 says that to the men, right, the spies, go there and bring Rahab here. But notice what they did. They brought Rahab outside of the camp of Israel. It's like she did not belong to the people of God. Isn't that funny? We want to... Uh, Compare our levels of holiness. They put her outside. Stay there, Rahab. Verse 24 is very difficult for us in this modern time because they burned the city with fire and everything in it. They killed everybody, the young, the old. This is so difficult. This is sometimes where people that don't see the whole narrative of the Bible look at the God of the Old Testament. God is so an angry God. And God of the New Testament is this good guy that let it pass. It's, oh, it's okay. But this is not our God. Our God is the same in the Old Testament as in the New Testament. There are two factors here that we will not expound this morning, but eventually in the next the chapters we will. I just want to mention to you, there is one, it's called hyperbole, which is for us in Western readers and writers, we are very technical and literal. We want things literal the way they are. But that was not in the mind of the writers of the Old Testament. They were born in a different culture, in a different time. And for them, the focus here, the focus of the text is always to emphasize the great thing that happened. Right? So, it's like um, if I'm telling, let's say this week we had a meeting with the youth here was really nice, and let's say that Joanna wasn't there, and I'm going to call Joanna and say, Joanna, it was really cool. Everybody was there, like everybody from our church. It was really nice, and we loved it. We had this, we had pizza, we had this, this. Was everybody from the church there? No. But is that important for my, what I want to tell her? No, I just, I want to tell her how great it was. So, some would see that a problem 
hyperbole. Oh, that's a problem because if you're saying that the Bible has hyperbole, you're saying that not everything is exactly the way it was, so it means that the Bible is not true. The Bible is not to be trustworthy, and that's not true. Because the, the, the Word is sufficient, the Word is infallible. However, we need to understand in the context that it was written, in the style that it was written, and we have to bring it to our reality. That's our job. That's our job of the preaching. We take the understanding of the Word in the context that it was written, and we apply it in our lives, in, in where we are. So it's totally understandable to have a different culture and a different style of writing in that. No problem. And also, this is one point. We have the hyperbole. Also, another thing is God uses his people as means of judgment. In the Old Testament, we, if, you, if we go back to Deuteronomy, to Numbers, we see that the people of Canaan, they were doing horrible things, like really, really bad. They were sacrificing their children. They were using the, the, the things of the temple to worship their own gods. And they did that not for two or three years. They did that for more than 500 years. And this is wrong. And God is holy. And God punishes the people. God uses the wicked to discipline his people, and he uses his people as judgment. And God can do anything because he is God. Amen. So we have these two. I'm going, I'm going just to leave that uh, here, and we'll discuss more of that uh, in the next expositions. But what is interesting is that we see that even if it's hyperbole, because in the book of Judges, we see that there are people from Canaan. If you, chapter 1 of Judges, if you go there, you see that in the times of Judges, the people of Canaan did this and that. So this verse said that they killed everybody. Right? And the third thing is destruction is the Hebrew verb that also means cleansing and expel. So it's possible that they expelled everybody out of the out of Canaan. Verse 25. But Rahab, the prostitute in her father's households and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived where? In Israel. You see now it's different. She's not outside the camp anymore. She, is li she has lived in Israel to this day. She was accepted as the people of Israel. And it's so beautiful that God used this former prostitute to be the mother of Boaz. Boaz was the redeemer of Ruth. She was the great, great, I don't know how many, uh, four generations, uh, grandmother of David. She is, if you go to Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, you see the name of Rahab right there. She's in, in the lineage of Jesus. And it's interesting, not because she was a prostitute and she's there, but all, everybody that was there, they were sinners, right? Everybody. Only Jesus is perfect. So now she's in the people of Israel. And finally, Joshua makes this oath. Um, if anyone rebuilds this city... We will have this happening to him. And Hiel of Bethel did that. In 1 Kings 16, 34, he, built the city of, he rebuilt the city of Jericho at the cost of his firstborn. He laid his foundations in the cost of his young son. He set up his, its gates. It was during the reign of Ahab, one of the most wicked kings of Israel. Remember Jezebel and Ahab? Yeah, that happened there. So, what do we do with that? It's a lot of information, a lot of technical things, a lot of story here. But Rahab was out. God fulfilled his promise. Nobody did anything. There was no actual fight. 
how was Rahab accepted into these people? You need to remember this. Your identity is received, not achieved. You are received into the people of God. Rahab could never be an Israelite. She was born out of the, the country. She was a prostitute. Everything counted against her. And everything counted against us. But because of Christ, our identity, we receive this identity. Yes, God will ask you to do things for him. But these things will always be a response. Remember the Ten Commandments? When did God give the Ten Commandments? He only gave the Ten Commandments after he freed the people. People were not in Egypt. They were out of Egypt. So God regenerates us, and then he gives us a way to live for his glory. So may God help us look at others with grace and compassion. We might invite these people into our camp, per se. But when we invite people in, we, we know that we don't deserve anything. It's only by grace and mercy of God. So, this big host of the UFC fight, UFC fight says it's time. The, the bell rings, fight's over. The fight's over. You don't even warm up because God won. God won the battle. The whole narrative of Joshua is pointing to a mighty and loving God, which points to our greater Joshua, Jesus, who not only won all of our battles, but is also leading us in every step of the way to the promised land, while we eagerly want and look for eternal life with him. May the Lord help us see that this is not only the story of Israel. This is our story. Our greater Joshua fought for us and won for us. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us understand that we do not deserve your grace. We do not deserve this mercy. I pray that you would open our hearts to understand that our identity in you is not achieved. We cannot do anything to achieve that. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Help us be that church that's always looking up to you and trusting you in everything. In Jesus' name, amen.